Bonjour. My dear colleagues, dear students, dear Professor Schifrin, and dear Professor Stiglitz. It's my great pleasure to welcome on campus Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who will today receive the HEC Paris Honoris Causa Doctorate. Additionally, we will have the honor of listening to Professor Stiglitz as he delivers a speech entitled Creating a Learning Society, a New Approach to Growth, Development, and Social Progress. Before introducing Professor Stiglitz, I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank the audience for being here in such great numbers, gathered to listen to one of the most important economists and thinkers of your age. Thanks also to Anya Schifrin, your wife, professor at Columbia as well, who has been kind enough to be with us today. Thank you. Now, our distinguished guest, Professor Stiglitz has conducted for his whole career pioneering work on the theory of contracts, risk and the economics of information that has been applied in numerous research fields. Not only in economics, finance and management, but also in many other social sciences. Throughout his, his career, he has, questions, he has questioned, received wisdom, and has tried to understand how we can repair market failures that are not evident for the most hardened of free market enthusiasts. This work led to the Nobel Prize in Economics, which he received in 2001. But Professor Stiglitz is not only a towering academic figure, teaching successively at MIT, Yale, Stanford, Princeton, Oxford, and Columbia. And last but not least, having today's this conference at HEC. <laughs> Believe me, a nice institution too. <laughs> In fact, the specificity of Professor Stiglitz has always been his active commitment in many important policy debates that have shaped the world today and are essential for the future of civil society. He has written many best-selling books on these important matters and has held numerous influential appointments. To illustrate this civil involvement, we can, we can remind that he, has a, he was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors from 1993 to 1995 during the Clinton administration, and that he served as a CEA uh, chairman from 1995 to 1997, helping to shape, to shape the economic success of the American economy in the 90s. From this time in office, he gathered valuable insights on rethinking monet monetary policy. After that, he became the chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank and served there between 1997 and 2000. During his tenure there, he broke apart the Washington Consensus, questioning globalization based on unfettered expansion of markets, pointing to the dangers and the policies that were implemented by the IMF and the World Bank when dealing with crisis and economic policy. An important question is how to properly help developing countries grow, though avoiding the pitfalls that we know of. He continues to actively study these issues at the co-president of the Columbia University's initiative for policy dialogue which consults governments and organizations, and he founded. In 1995, he was also a lead author of the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared in 2007 Nobel Peace Prize 
another good illustration of your civil commitment beside academia. In France, in 2008, Professor Stiglitz chaired the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress at the request of the French President Nicolas Sarkozy. The important question is how to move beyond measuring economic development only based on gross domestic product and how to include other measures as well-being, such as life expectancy and the quality of life. This work is being continued today at the OECD. Recently, Professor Stiglitz has focused his attention on the role of inequality in society and what the implications of this for economic outcomes. Of course, you can imagine that Professor Stiglitz has received numerous awards and distinction for his work and has been a life-changing professor and mentor for thousands of his students. He was awarded the John Bates Clark Award, given biennially by the American Economic Association to the economist under 40, was made the most significant contribution to the field. To the field. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Economic Econometric Society, and he is a corresponding fellow of the Royal Society and the British Academy. To add to this non-exhaustive list, Professor Stiglitz is also an officier de la Légion d'honneur, as you can see with his red rosette. Once again, I would like to congratulate warmly our honoris causa recipient. Through his, this award, we would like to thank you not only for your paramount achievements, but also for your difficult and provocative questions that force us here at HEC constantly to reevaluate our lives and the organization of the society we are living in. I shall now give the floor to my colleague, Professor Michael Thomas Michalski from, the, from our faculty. He belongs to the Economics and Decision Sciences Department, and he made this day possible. Thank you very much for that, Thomas. And he is an expert of your work and also a real fan of you. <laughs> you will see that. And uh, he will, of course, in his presentation, be more precise than I have been. Once again, thank you very much for being here, and congratulations. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming here. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today Joseph Stiglitz, the HEC's Honoris Causa recipient. Let me talk about his work and its meaning for our everyday lives. This is actually a difficult task. For his academic career spanned numerous fields of economics and had important impact on finance, management, and other social sciences. But before I do that, However, let me tell you how you get the Nobel Prize. Some people in the room may be interested. You know, why not? When I was Stiglitz TA, once I woke up at 5.30 a.m. and proudly went to the office to start my day at 6, right? I met Edmund Phelps, another uh, Nobel Prize winner on my way, so I was very proud of myself, right? The day starts magnificently. I opened my mailbox, and I already had three letters from Joe written at 4.30 a.m. <laughs> so as you see, it's not easy to get the Nobel Prize. You got to get up early. Let me try now to be more serious and summarize the extent of Joseph Stiglitz's work, because it's really important. He studied throughout his career market failures. The world is really far away from the textbook competitive equilibrium complete markets model that may be elegant uh, intellectually, but might lead to grave mistakes if treated too seriously. There are information asymmetries. There is moral hazard. That is, when the actions of agents are unobservable, so we don't know what they're doing. 
There is adverse selection when the types of agents are unknown or externalities. Then there are risks in various forms and incomplete markets that to fully uh, ensure against them. So Stiglitz studied these issues throughout his career and how they impact the behavior and the incentives of agents and the contracts that are crafted to counter these problems, such as insurance or employment. The criticisms of the standard uh, prevailing models was in a rigorous form, based often in competitive equilibrium. He provided us with many path-breaking and cautioning results, poking fun at the prevailing orthodoxy at the time and furthering significantly our understanding of economics. So what does Stiglitz's work help us on a practical level in everyday life? In the presence of moral hazard, adverse selection and risk, we need to carefully write contracts to achieve desired goals. Prices may not be informative and can, we can have credit rationing in the markets. Markets may not be efficient and we should not put too much faith in them. But they're like democracy. Is there any viable alternative? Policy or reform can have unintended consequences. Market liberalization may not give desired outcomes if we have strong market failures. As an example, it is believed that the run-up to the 2008 crisis can be thought of as moral hazard in action. Wrong incentives at the regulated banks at the local branches, but also at high management levels, were largely responsible for the bad loans at the micro level and the faulty asset-backed securities that were created and later traded in financial markets. Looking back, perhaps this could have been avoided with better regulation and contracting. In popular perception, Stiglitz sometimes is portrayed as a left-wing militant. But this is, I believe, misreading his work. I will try to convince you of that in my further discussion. If you listen carefully, fair competition for him is important and necessary for efficiency. But perhaps the system should not be rigged in the favor of the privileged by birth, the wealthy, large corporations, or developing, developed countries. I would describe Joseph Stiglitz as a Rolgian that deeply understands the multiple risks that exist in our everyday lives. As the late Ulrich Beck put it, wealth accumulates at the top, risks at the bottom. The poor are exposed to more risks, be they environmental, related to employment or income, and also have less information on how to avoid them. In such circumstances, state intervention may, could be warranted and in fact desirable. Let me mention now some of uh, Joseph Stiglitz's important works and my favorite ones, too. The list is too long to name them all. This will show you the extent and nature of our uh, honoris causa recipients today work. So Joseph Stiglitz provided an early characterization of investment under risk. An important part of uh, his work is about the fear of contracts. For example, a rationalization of um, sharecropping, why inefficient forms of contracting may prevail. But one of the most celebrated results is that of one of Rothschild and Stiglitz about screening, menus that serve to extract information by the uninformed from the informed parties. A firm may not know much about their different customers. How to learn about them? Offer them menus and they will self-select, picking uh, the one that suits them best, and by this revealing information about their types. That's, for example, what cell phone companies do. Remember the last time you actually selected your cell phone provider? You saw many plans to choose from. When you chose, you revealed the information on the type of the customer you are. Why do firms do this, you might ask? Well, to maximize profits and bleed you dry. So everybody here is a victim of that paper. There is the remarkable paper of Grossman and Stiglitz on information in asset markets and the informativeness of prices. The results are, in a rigorous competitive equilibrium setup, intuitive and striking. In their framework, prices actually cannot fully reveal available information if traders have different information about the characteristics of the assets traded. 
But suppose the prices would be informative. What would happen then? No one would have an incentive to acquire information when it is costly. Everyone would just wait for the markets to reveal it. But then, who would channel the information to the markets in the first place? Bang! There goes the efficient markets hypothesis. Right? It never goes away, no. There's a series of papers by Stiglitz and co-authors on the pitfalls of monetary policy in the presence of moral hazard and adverse selection. In a nutshell, high interest rates may lead to uh, worse loan portfolios and, uh, or excessive risk taking on the part of the borrowers, which is going to undermine the banking system. To avoid these negative effects, banks may choose to rather ration credit than by instead of charging higher interest rates. This also renders traditional monetary policy definitely less effective and actually more dangerous. Considerations about effort may lead for the necessity of efficiency wages above the market clearing wages to incentivize employees to work hard. This is what the Shapiro and Stiglitz paper is about. Unemployment there is not only a feature of the equilibrium, which was anathema at the time. It is also an incentive device against shirking. You need to be scared of being fired to work diligently. There is a brilliant French book, by the way, called Bonjour Paresse on the subject. Read it. Uh, so next time you watch the, that movie online during work, feel guilty. Because of people behaving like you, we may have high unemployment. Finally, something from my own field, international economics. There is this fantastic Newberry and Stiglitz paper on Pareto in theory trade. They show that opening markets to trade may be well for reducing when the markets are incomplete, when there is an increase in risk that may outweigh any gains from trade. This was one of the first voices that rigorously introduced the subject, which became today a subfield of its own, and was done at the time when free trade was a part of the Orwellian two feet bad, four feet good free market orthodoxy. I should also mention here the useful Dixit and Stiglitz demand system. Without using it, you couldn't prove a point in international trade in the last 30 years. This list can go on and on and on. Clearly, our today's guest is a towering academic figure. But this does not stop here. As mentioned earlier by Dean, Joseph Stiglitz is deeply involved in policy making and shaping important debates. He had cohorts of students, and a couple of them are in this room today, and is a formidable teacher. He co-wrote many textbooks, uh, with the 1980 lecture on public policy still being the Bible in the field. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome the 2001 Nobel Prize winner, Joseph Stiglitz. Well, thank you very much for those introductions. Uh, they're very flattering. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, talk about this afternoon is uh, some more recent work that I've been engaged in uh, with my uh, colleague and good friend, Bruce Greenwald. And it's about uh, creating a learning society. Uh, let me just summarize the two major themes I'm gonna raise and then uh, go back and try to develop them. The first is that successful and sustained growth requires creating a learning society. And this is true especially in the 21st century as we move to a knowledge economy. And the second, uh, and particularly important, is that markets on their own will not do this, which means there needs to be systemic, systematic interventions by the government. Uh, this is an example we refer to as market failures. Uh, talked about uh, market failures in information, market failures in, in uh, uh, lack of competition, but one of the most important market failures has to do with creating a learning society, creating a society that uh, uh, maximizes uh, 
uh, advances in standards of living. And that's precisely uh, why this topic uh, is so important that I'm going to try to uh, explain that, that uh, uh, creating a learning society uh, is an es essential, was the essential thing which distinguished the last 200, 250 years uh, from what went on before. I'm also going to try to argue that this perspective not only changes how we view government policy, but also has strong implications for how we think about the structure of our society and our democracy. So let me first begin with the importance of creating a learning society. The transformation to learning societies that occurred around 1800 for Western economies, and more recently for those in Asia, appears to have had a far, far greater impact on human well-being than improvements in allocative efficiency or resource allocation. And those of you who've studied standard economics know it's, that, that is what has been the focus of most of economics, is talking about improvements in the efficiency of resource allocation or uh, increasing uh, the supplies of, of capital. But what I'm going to try to argue is actually far more important than those traditional focus, uh, focus on, on allocative efficiency and resource accumulation is a, a focus on learning. And if that's so, we ought to be focusing our attention on what maximizes learning, what facilitates learning. And what I'm going to also try to argue is that some of the prescriptions about uh, the focus on allocative efficiency leads to policies which actually may inhibit learning. So it's not that they're two different ideas, they're, the, the two views may actually be in conflict. The basic uh, notion is that if you look back in history, for literally hundreds and hundreds of years, standards of living were basically constant. And this chart goes back to uh, the year 1000. I'm not going to say the data was very good back then, but uh, uh, all the data we have basically says the same thing. Going back to as far back as you can go, standards of living were basically constant. And this is true uh, across countries. Um, and it wasn't until sometime around 1750, 1800, that you see in Europe a sharp spike, and more recently in China and India. And you can see that this, this dramatic transformation, uh, really a, 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 what was flat for hundreds of years, suddenly started to increase. And you can see this uh, reflected in a whole uh, large number of other data sets. This is uh, another data set based on real wages of uh, London craftsmen um, from uh, 1,200 to 2,000. Uh, some societies like to gather data and were uh, fortunate that they gathered this data. Why they did that, I don't know. Uh, but we have the data and what we see is that, that again, wages stayed basically constant uh, in the case of wages until about 1850 and then again, they soared. A similar thing can uh, results of, uh, uh, obtained if you look at uh, life expectancy um, suddenly starting to grow since 1820, and and uh, if you go back, it's a similar kind of pattern that uh, life expectancy was low uh, and been low for for hundreds of years, and then suddenly uh, it started to in increase. So. Uh, that raises the question, what caused this sudden change? And I think the, the uh, simple answer uh, is the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment people have been talking about a great deal in the last few days. Uh, it was a change in mindset, uh, a change in mindset that's associated with questioning authority, with tolerance, um, with uh, the notion that recognizing change was possible. It led to uh, the scientific method, which provided a systematic way of figuring out how to improve productivity. That is, getting more outputs from a given amount of inputs. Uh, an important thing that I'll have uh, time only to mention uh, briefly at the end, but I think I do want to stress, 
This change in mindset is associated with the creation of liberal democracies. So when we're talking in the last few days about liberal democracies, we shouldn't separate the fact that we should recognize that that without these liberal democracies, we would not have had those dramatic changes that I showed before in the living standards that have marked the last 250 years, that those two are actually very intimately uh, related. Uh, and that's why I believe that sustaining increases in standard of living, especially uh, shared prosperity, will require sustaining liberal democracies. The subject <clears throat> has been, uh, uh, in a way, uh, um, part of economics for a long time, but it's been part of, of not part of the mainstream. It's been part of a fringe. For instance, uh, Joseph Schumpeter uh, talked about the importance of innovation, of technical change, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. But uh, his work was not part of uh, the core macro courses, the core uh, courses that were taught, and still are not part of the core courses that are taught, at least in many parts uh, of the world. Um, the great achievement of my teacher, Bob Solo, <clears throat> was that he figured out a way of quantifying uh, how important technical change was and parsing out what, what fraction of that sharp increase in living standards was due to the accumulation of capital, and what part was due to something else, and in particular to innovation. And his big insight was to show that a very small part of that increase in standard of living, about less than 20%, was due to uh, an increase in capital accumulation. In the case of developing countries, um, this has led to a rethinking of development strategies. The World Bank was founded on the idea that what separated developed from developing countries was a gap in resources. That was why it was a bank. It was how me it meant to facilitate the movement of capital from the developed to developing countries. Interesting, at that point in time, everybody recognized that markets didn't work, that private markets would not move capital from the rich countries to the poor countries, that you needed something else, and that was why it's a public institution that was created to do this. But now we recognize that even more important than this gap in resources is a gap in knowledge, and that uh, it is, uh, this gap in knowledge is what separates developing from developed countries. But I want to also emphasize that in developed countries, there are large gaps in knowledge. Large gaps in knowledge, for instance, between the productivity of the most uh, productive firms and the average, and let alone uh, uh, the least productive firms. This idea is actually uh, very antithetical to this, uh, again, a standard idea that we talk about in microeconomics, where you talk about a production function, and it's almost always assumed that firms are all on the production function. But the reality is that most firms are far from it. Most firms, almost all firms are far from it in one dimension or another. And that means that moving the firms from below the production possibility to the production possibility is a major way of increasing standards of living and increasing productivity. But what keeps them below? It's not resources, it's really knowledge. And so that's why creating a, a learning society where people learn more efficiently of how to go from uh, below the frontier of knowledge to the frontier is so important. So this is the first idea that I wanted to stress, is that learning in, in, is very important, both for developing and developed countries. It's important for our understanding of why standards of living have increased uh, so much over the last 200 years. And the second idea is that markets don't do this very well. Uh, markets on their own are not efficient in promoting innovation. In a way, the way we came to this idea was very much related to uh, uh, the, the work that I had done earlier uh, in the economics of information, because information is, in a way, a particular kind of knowledge. 
Uh, it's an example of a kind of knowledge. It's a knowledge about the state of the world. Uh, when we're talking about innovation, we're talking about knowledge about what is possible, how to produce things, but it's a kind of knowledge. Uh, what uh, my colleague Bruce Greenwald and I had shown, uh, we had you know, uh, done a lot of research on the what was mentioned before on, on uh, the nature of markets, where there are information asymmetries, that's just a fancy word for saying that some people know things that other people don't know. Uh, the fact that there are information symmetries, knowledge asymmetries, should be obvious, because if you knew everything that I knew, there'd be no point of my uh, talking to you now. So uh, the very fact that there are these lectures is, is evidence that, that uh, there are at least some information asymmetries. Uh, and uh, what uh, Bruce and I showed was uh, that when information is, asymmet is a, a imperfect and asymmetric, uh, when risk markets were imperfect, and these are conditions that are always true, the reason that the invisible hand, the idea that the pursuit of self-interest would lead as if by an invisible hand to uh, the well-being of society, to uh, an efficient allocation, the reason that the invisible hand uh, was invisible was that it wasn't there. Uh, that is to say that markets were not, in general, efficient. But because it should be clear that information and knowledge are really very similar concepts, it's not a surprise at all that economies in which knowledge is important, which is all economies, are not going to be efficient. Um, and in the book that, I'm, uh, that this lecture is based on, uh, Creating Learning Society, we try to go into d more detail into the various uh, inefficiencies, the market failures that are associated with creating a learning society, with a cre creating a learning economy. Uh, but if we go back to the early work uh, several decades ago by Ken Arrow, uh, he recognized that markets by themselves do not yield efficiency in the production and dissemination of knowledge. Uh, the most important reason for this is that knowledge is a public good. Uh, and uh, this is a concept, the Samsonian public good. A public good is uh, um, a good that, which has the characteristic that uh, the marginal cost of an additional person having that good is zero. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was the third president of the United States, uh, put this idea uh, much more poetically and before the mathematics uh, was there. Uh, and he said that knowledge is like a candle. When one candle likes another, it doesn't diminish from the light of the first candle. That's much better, isn't it, than the, uh, saying that it's a public good. Uh, well, uh, the point is that whenever the, uh, there are public goods, Markets are not efficient in the supply of public goods. And for an obvious reason, the basic theory of competitive pricing is that you should charge the marginal cost. But if the marginal cost is zero, you charge a price of zero, it's, not, it's hard to make money charging a price of zero. Uh, I assume you've learned that kind of idea. And, and, uh, uh, that, that, uh, and uh, in the absence of revenues, you can't provide provide the public good, and so uh, markets on their own won't be efficient in the provision of public goods. They will either try to restrict the usage of the public good, which is inefficient, uh, or there will be an undersupply. And in most cases, there's both restriction in the usage, which is inefficient, and uh, an undersupply. Uh, Another property of most knowledge is that there are important spillovers and externalities. Uh, when uh, you t take any of the basic innovations, the person who discovered DNA, the transistors, lasers, uh, these have had tremendous effects in our society and our economy, but the innovator got only a small fraction of the benefits. The benefits spill over uh, across society. 
And there are other imperfections. Uh, uh, markets in which innovation is important are typically imperfectly competitive. Uh, innovation is inherently risky because if you knew the outcome of research project, it wouldn't be a research project. Uh, the nature of research is that it is inherently imperfect, and there are imperfect risk markets for particularly these kinds of risks. And we can explain why that is having to do with asymmetries information, but the, 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 bad, the bottom line is that because of these inherent uh, imperfections of competition, capital markets, uh, markets won't be efficient in uh, the supply, in the production of knowledge. And that is the basis for why it is that there has to be government policies. Uh, the policies, however, that promote a transformation to a learning society are markedly different than those traditionally advocated by economists, which focus on improving the static efficiency of resource allocation and the accumulation of capital. Uh, those ideas that focused on resource allocation and the accumulation of capital uh, are central to the policies that have been referred to as the Washington Consensus was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, and uh, those are the policies that were pushed by the IMF and the World Bank uh, for, for literally decades. And what we argue is uh, not only did they ignore the learning consequences, from the perspective of creating learning society, those policies are often counterproductive. The notion that there could be a conflict between static and dynamic perspectives, between the short-run perspectives that were the focus of the Washington Consensus and the long-run dynamic uh, issues that I want to, uh, I'm talking about here is actually uh, been long recognized, but, but the pervasiveness of this uh, has not been. For instance, one of the uh, uh, aspects, institutions that, that everybody talks about today is intellectual property. <clears throat> the notion of intellectual property is that it restricts the use of knowledge. That's the sole intent, is to say, if you discover something, you have the right to restrict the use of knowledge. But that's a distortion, because as I said before, knowledge is a public good. If, if, if it should be the case that uh, that knowledge should be as widely used as possible. The most dramatic example of, of these kinds of inefficiencies is we have here, we have, you know, the, uh, uh, drugs that can reduce the, the uh, incidence of, uh, it can uh, uh, reduce the, the consequences of AIDS. We have drugs that can deal with cancer. Um, the cost of producing these drugs, say a, a, a year's treatment of an AIDS drug, is somewhere today around $100 to $200. But the drug companies, until quite recently, were charging $10,000 a year. The big discrepancy between the, the market price and the cost of production. That was the monopoly power of the patent. Now, it's bad enough if you're in a rich country and uh, where you can afford it, but, but if you were living in a poor country where the per capita income was $500 and they're charging $10,000, that is a death sentence. So it's not only an economic policy, it's a matter of life and death. And the same thing is going on today in the cancer drugs. Um, in the United States, we had a big battle over uh, the ability to, to patent uh, the BRAC genes, which are the genes that determine the likelihood that you're going to get uh, uh, breast cancer. And a private company wanted to charge a very, very high price for that test. Uh, Yale University developed a test that was uh, much better, and they were willing to give it out free. But the private company who said they owned your, your genes said that you couldn't do the test uh, because it was not profit maximizing. Uh, you had to pay them and, uh, and, and they wanted the data and they didn't want anybody else to have the data. Well, these are all examples of, of how intellectual property restricts the use of knowledge. The argument for intellectual property was that we're willing to accept 
these costs because of the uh, dynamic benefits. So there was a trade-off between the short-run cost and the long-run benefits. In fact, I won't have time to talk about it. There's increasing evidence that the dynamic benefits may be negative, that we've gotten an unbalanced intellectual property regime which, in which we lose in the short run as well as losing in the long run. The broader pr point I want to raise is that uh, if learning is at the center of the increases in standards of living, if learning is at the center of, of development, it implies that a central question of growth and development should be what should governments do to promote growth through learning? Um, the question is especially salient because such policies may be in conflict with conventionally advocated policies. So there are many dimensions once we start looking at the world uh, through this lens. Uh, we want to affect, uh, ask the question how policies, how institutions, how we design our society, how we design our institutions affect capabilities of learning, incentives to learn, uh, how they facilitate learn, learning and how they catalyze it. Um, what are the mindsets that are conducive to learning? Again, reemphasizing the importance of the Enlightenment. Uh, what are the impediments uh, that are created to learning? Uh, we want to study how does learning occur? And a special attention of, uh, to ideas like learning by doing and learning to learn. So what I'm going to do <clears throat> in this uh, talk is I'm not going to be able to talk about all these issues. I'm going to focus on and depending on uh, 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 how long I ramble, uh, I, I will uh, focus on uh, macro stability, say a few words about role of education, and then hopefully talk a little bit about trade and industrial policies. So on macro stability, uh, one of the things that uh, is pretty clear from a lot of research is that stability is important to learning. Uh, and there are several reasons for this that much of knowledge resides within institutions and firms. And when you go have a deep economic downturn, a recession, depression, it destroys firms. Uh, they go into bankruptcy. And in doing that, they destroy the embedded knowledge. In effect, there is negative learning. Uh, when uh, I was uh, involved in the, in the uh, big debates about how to deal with the East Asia crisis when I was at the World Bank in, in 1997. Um, uh, some people uh, at the IMF said, uh, we have to raise interest rates to very high levels. We're not talking about high levels. In the case of Korea, the uh, case of Indonesia, they wanted to raise them to 80%. Uh, in the case of, uh, 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 Korea, they only raised them to 40%. Uh, you could imagine, think of yourself in the, uh, in the, uh, as running a business, uh, what would happen uh, to a business if the interest rate went to 80% or even 40% or even 25%. Uh, guess what? A lot of them went bankrupt. Uh, in fact, 50% uh, of the firms in Korea, 75% of those in Indonesia uh, were not able to pay the money that was due when they raised the interest rates. Well, the, when, I, when I argued with the IMF at the time that this was going to lead to massive bankruptcy, this was going to be very destructive of their economies, uh, they said, don't worry. If it turns out that our estimate of what this would do it was that bad, they would change their policy. And I said, well, uh, that's very nice, but when you lower the interest rate, you don't unbankrupt the firms that are bankrupt. You know, uh, death is a one-way uh, event. Um, economists would say there's a hysteresis effect. Uh, so so uh, the basic point is that the knowledge that is lost when a company goes bankrupt is very hard to recreate. Uh, it's embedded in the institution. Um, it's also the case that recessions impede learning because attention gets focused just on survival and firms are not going to be spending their, their resources on long-term research. Their focus is uh, how to get through the recession. 
And finally, recessions impede the most important aspect of human capital accumulation, which is on-the-job learning. Uh, you know, there are, we often divide education into two parts, but it's now become much more uh, uh, porous boundary between uh, formal education, which is going on here, and on-the-job learning. Um, and uh, even though we're uh, not consistent with my self-interest to say this, the most important part of learning occurs after you leave here. Uh, if the most important part of learning is, is on the job. But if you don't have any job, there's no on the job learning. Uh, and uh, there are long-term consequences for growth and standards of living. So uh, the bottom line uh, is the Euro recession, the recession that is going on now in Europe, will have uh, an impact on the long-term standards of living uh, that will be enormous. Uh, and uh, these are important effects that have not, I think, been appro uh, appropriately taken into account in, in the uh, formulation of the po uh, po uh, policy makers. Um, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I want to emphasize, you know, it's bad enough here in France, but then countries like Spain, Portugal, uh, uh, Greece, uh, these countries are in depression. Uh, as, as you know, my, uh, you know, youth unemployment, since the beginning of that uh, recession, has been over 50%. And uh, the numbers would be far worse if it were not for the fact that there's been so much out-migration from these countries. The magnitude of uh, the downturn in Europe, you can see from this uh, chart, where I've uh, drawn uh, uh, growth uh, fairly steady from 1980 to 2008. Uh, a little wiggle, but not much of a wiggle from here. One of the interesting things is uh, the euro was supposed to be a great event that was going to promote economic growth. What you see is no positive effect. So from 2000 to 2008, there's nothing going on. So nobody can say that the euro had a positive effect on economic growth. But what you can see very clearly is that the euro crisis had a terribly negative effect. And if you look at the dotted line, which is where Europe would have been, if you extrapolate that trend, and the green dots are where you are, what you see is a huge gap opening up. And what I hope you can see on that is that gap is getting wider and wider. Anybody who says that the crisis is over, uh, which you sometimes hear in Germany, and this is the whole Eurozone, which includes Germany, um, uh, the fact is the disparity between where you would have been in the absence of the crisis and where you are uh, is enormous. The dotted blue line going down is the cumulative loss, which is already in the trillions of dollars and is increasing uh, uh, month by month. Well, that raises a question. You go back to this chart and you say, look at uh, today in Europe, there's the same human capital, physical capital, natural capital that there was before the crisis. You know, a little bit less investment because of the crisis, but not, not a great deal. So basically, the state variables, the capital stocks, are the same as they were before. So how can you explain what has happened? There's no theory that says debt should supposed to bring your GDP down. Debt is just something that one country, some people in one country owe to other people in that country. It's a, uh, who owns the assets? Who has the claims? But the theory should be is, the standard theory is, that you should be using your resources efficiently and just this is just who gets the benefits of those. But what we've seen is that debt and the mismanagement of the crisis has resulted in uh, this uh, terrible performance. But there's another way of thinking about it is that if there is this much lower level of output, and let me emphasize, 
going forward, all the extrapolations are that you will never, never make up for this gap. The best that will happen is that you will move parallel to where you would have been. But it's not going to be that you're going to get back to that red dotted curve. The best is that you'll just stop losing. So if that's the case, and you have the same physical capital, the same natural capital, the same human capital, what is going on? And that leads to the idea of missing real capital. Recessions destroy capital or impede its accumulation. We can trace out the consequences for a small fraction of this for the plant and equipment, uh, but we don't adequately trace out the consequences for other forms of capital. And uh, the missing capital, uh, one can quantify this. What is the missing capital? It's the knowledge, it's the learning that would have occurred of people learning on the job. It's the knowledge that would have been embedded in the firms if they had not gone bankrupt. So at least a large fraction of this missing capital is knowledge capital that would have been accumulated and has not. And with that has been actual capital that was there and has been destroyed. A back of the envelope calculation suggests that the magnitude of this capital is enormous, probably in excess of $30 trillion, depending on the discount rate. Well, the um, uh, important point of, of stressing all this is that if we had, if Europe had realized the cost of the policies, the austerity policies the, uh, uh, that, that have been introduced, and realize what you're doing in this process is destroying capital. It's not just the GDP is lower, but you are in the process of destroying or, uh, 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 capital that would, uh, not, uh, not creating capital that wouldn't be there. We're talking about uh, losses that are in the trillions of dollars. And that, I think, would have met, perhaps given a different perspective uh, uh, to what is going on. So this idea of missing capital is consistent with the hysteresis effects associated with extended periods of unemployment and helps explain why effects of downturns persist with strong, I think it has strong policy implications. Uh, there are very uh, significant long-term consequences of not taking the kinds of uh, counter-cyclical policies that uh, they should have taken. Uh, the focus on government debt was short-sighted because they focused on one side of the balance sheet. They talked about the liabilities that might grow. They didn't think about the assets that didn't grow. And so in some sense, at a fundamental level, Europe's balance sheet, if you could have seen that missing capital, is much worse today than it would have been if they had pursued alternative uh, policies. This is another example of why metrics matter. This was the, the central message of, of the Commission on Measuring Economic Performance and Social Progress uh, that I chaired. Uh, what you measure affects what you do. If you focus on the liability side of the government, one may take actions that result in the liability of the private sector increasing and the asset side of the entire economy decreasing, undermining sustainability, undermining long-term well-being. So that's the first uh, uh, example of how focusing on this learning changes perspectives on economic policy. The second I want to talk about fairly briefly is education. And here I want to just emphasize that, that particularly with this uh, uh, change in the structure of our economy, uh, we have to change the focus on uh, what occurs in the formal part of our education system. The model that we used to have of education was, uh, to put it a little bit crudely, uh, in their first 16 years of schooling or 18 years or however, you try to pour as much information into the brain as you can. Um, you give lectures and people write it down assiduously and hopefully in that process imprint is made on the brain and they'll remember it for the next 40 years of their working life. That was basically the model. And good education was pouring more money, more uh, 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 ideas, knowledge into the brain and hoping to that it gets retained. Well, uh, as I said before, uh, 
only a small part of learning actually occurs in formal schooling. And in a very dynamic economy, the learning that occurs in that first 16 years may not be relevant 20 years from then. Uh, the world changes very rapidly, and knowledge at one point may not be as relevant. Uh, uh, what one learns now may not be that relevant uh, in, in, in 20 years. Moreover, I think in a fundamental way, the internet has changed things because one has accessible at one's fingertip uh, enormous amounts of information, knowledge, that you could never stuff into anybody's brain. Um, the problem is how to evaluate that knowledge, how to search for that knowledge, how to assess it, and most importantly, how to learn how to learn. And so that is really uh, trying to, to uh, uh, educate for lifelong learning is really what our formal education institutions uh, should be about. Um, there's another change uh, that has uh, gone on, and that is the nature of what goes on in on-the-job training. An example of the old model, uh, one might look to say General Motors in the United States, where it was typical, this was the canonical American firm, out of a mill firm, um, paid very good wages. You got hired there when you graduated from high school. They gave you, uh, they had their own university, and you got a job, and you stayed with them for the rest of your life. So it was lifelong employment and lifelong learning. And they would provide training throughout that life because they knew you were going to stay with them. So they were able to capture the benefit of the learning that they were paying for. So it was, you might say it was like a fringe benefit, but it was a benefit that they captured a lot of the benefit of that uh, learning that they were going. Well, a number of things have changed. Uh, one of them is that GM no longer pays high wages. We saved the automobile industry in the United States by converting it into uh, a high paying jobs into really low paying jobs. So the new entry jobs into General Motors now pay $15 an hour, which is lower than minimum wage in Australia. Um, and so we've managed to get it to survive, the automobile industry to survive, but at the expense of really uh, growing inequality and, and low paid jobs. But the more important point I want to emphasize is that um, People don't stay on the same job for that long. The average person turns over very frequently. And that means the incentives of the employer to provide the education has diminished. And that means there will be more responsibility on the individual for getting his own education. Well, that's going to change the industrial structure, if you want to think about the industrial structure uh, uh, of education. Um, there's going to be less provision of education by employers. Uh, there's greater uncertainty about the na nature of future jobs. And that, the, the, these things to, together imply there's going to be greater need for individuals to have access to relevant continuing education. Uh, the good news is that the new technologies are at least holding op open the prospect that this can be done. Some of the MOOCs, the uh, 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 online courses, are at least for, uh, suggesting the possibility that there are uh, the two new technologies, which are changing the nature of the workplace, are also changing the nature of the educational uh, uh, of education lifelong. Long, lifelong. Um, just as an aside, learning perspective has has changed thinking about education in developing countries as well, and uh, when I. When I came to the World Bank, uh, the view was, and it was an understandable view, that all the focus was on primary education. Everybody recognized education was important, but the view was that uh, resources should all be devoted to primary education. And the, the view was partly a concern about equity, equity in the sense that it, 
the higher education would go to a small number of people, and they said that was unfair, and you ought to spread out education uh, to everybody. But with the World Development Report of 1998 uh, emphasizing the role of knowledge in development, one of the important ideas was that it was important for developing countries to close the gap with the developed countries. And if you're going to close that gap, you had to have people who were in a position to absorb knowledge and to translate the knowledge into the conditions of those countries. And that meant you, were, you at least had to have within these countries uh, well-functioning universities. Uh, you had to support higher education, uh, high school and, and secondary and, and tertiary education. Um, it also meant, though, one had to learn skills that enabled individuals to learn in the context in which they lived. For many people in uh, countries like Ethiopia, uh, the likelihood is they're going to continue to live in the rural sector. And so one had to develop a rural-based education system, uh, not one just qualifying individuals for urban jobs, which had been, again, another failing of the edu educational model that had been pursued pr pr prior to that. So the third topic I want to talk about uh, very briefly is uh, how this gives uh, new per perspectives on trade. So the standard theories that most of you know about are focused on comparative advantage. They talk about the gain from liberalization uh, and opening up markets. But these ideas that I'm talking about uh, focus on, on learning and try to say that there's a fundamental difference that, 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 that uh, 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 there can be as a result of production uh, important kinds of learning. The best example of this may be uh, Korea. When Korea began its development strategy in the 60s, its comparative advantage was growing rice. And the World Bank and the IMF uh, didn't do a lot of research to say to Korea, your comparative advantage was growing rice. So they told Korea to grow rice. Uh, Korea's response was, uh, thank you, but no thank you. Uh, you know, even if we are the most successful rice grower in the world, we are likely to remain poor. There is no advanced country that specializes in rice. And so they said, we want, we want to, we don't, we, we want to be in, in at least a middle income or above country. We don't want to be a poor rice grower. So they said, uh, we want to uh, uh, industrialize. Now, you don't learn about how to industrialize. You don't learn about how to produce steel by picking up a textbook and say, OK, here's a manual on steel production. And then having read that uh, and studied it carefully, open up a steel mill and say, OK, we're going to compete. What, what they did is, did is say the only way that we're going to produce steel, uh, the only way we're going to learn about producing steel, the only way we're going to learn about becoming an industrial economy is to become an industrial economy. But that meant they had to keep at bay imports of steel from other countries. So becoming an industrial economy meant they had to restrict the imports of steel and other goods. But with the view that they were not going to be just restricting the imports. These were going to be industries that they would get a dynamic comparative advantage and would become the new export industries. So they didn't have a comparative advantage in shipbuilding or in, chip, in, in, in computer chips when they began. In 1960, 1970, 1980, they didn't have a comparative advantage in any of these products. They didn't know how to make automobiles. But they said, nobody was born knowing, you know, the Swiss weren't born a thousand years ago knowing how to make Swiss watches. They learned how to make Swiss, Swiss watches. But you don't, again, learn about that from picking up a book. 
So the only way that they were going to learn how to industrialize, to industrialize how, how to produce these, get a, a comparative advantage, to get a dynamic comparative advantage, was uh, to, uh, to actually industrialize, and that meant they had to protect themselves. Now, the interesting, the important aspect that we emphasize in our, our work is that there are huge spillovers. Remember I talked about earlier that the nature of technology, the nature of learning, the nature of knowledge is that there are spillovers. And so when you had this growing industrial sector, it created a knowledge, demand for knowledge that then spilled over to all other sectors of the economy. So they began in a few industries, but the learning that they got in those industries spilled over to the entire economy. And that led to the fact that today Korea is uh, the 12th largest economy in the world. Uh, in terms of education, it, it, it ranks above the United States in the PISA scores that rank uh, uh, various countries. Uh, so, uh, they made uh, investments, and these investments uh, paid off. Well, the bottom line out of all of this is that uh, Thomas mentioned that one of my earlier studies was to point out that free trade does not necessarily increase the well-being of both countries. Uh, the standard theory was that free trade was good for both countries, for everybody. It was Pareto efficient. Uh, that's only true under very, very idealized conditions. And the paper that I wrote with David Newbery showed that, in fact, if there are not good risk markets, and let me be clear, there are not good risk markets, free trade could make everybody in both countries worse off. It was Pareto inferior trade that everybody could be worse off as a result of. You might be able to offset these effects by creating, providing adequate insurance, adequate risk, but, but, but typically we don't do that. So in the absence of adequate insurance markets, free trade could make everybody worse off. But this is providing another argument that is a critique of the standard argument for free trade. It says that, in fact, especially for developing countries, it can inhibit their ability to learn. And by inhibiting their ability to learn, stop them from going up that curve that I began the lecture with, that curve with that, that, allow, that marked the learning that marked the increases of standard living that were so great over the last 200 years. So uh, this is another argument for, for uh, uh, why developing countries need to think carefully about trade agreements. It's also an argument for why developed countries ought to think about it carefully. Now, more recently, the ability to engage in those kinds of restrictive practices has been restricted because uh, the WTO agreements has, is in, uh, restricted the ability to, to engage in, in these kinds of interventions. It's one thing, we've kept the ability of advanced countries to subsidize their agriculture, but we have not allowed developing countries to help their develop their manufacturing sector. And that ha has brought us to the new instrument that is used, which is exchange rate policy. And the interesting thing that we, we show in our book is that exchange rate policy can be an effective instrument for industrial policy. That by keeping exchange rates low in the way that China has, it has helped increase their industrial sector, allow them to learn, promoted their innovation, promoted their increases in their standard of living, and um, uh, 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 it, and it, interestingly, it may even pay, this is more of a theoretical nicety, it may even pay them, you know, when they create these, uh, uh, when they, when they uh, lower their exchange rate, it leads them to have trade surpluses, to build up reserves. It may even be worthwhile for them to build up reserves forever, that the benefits of learning each year outweigh the 
co the, the, the cost of not using the reserves that they have. Um, I mean, uh, there are many other implications uh, of, of this new theory. One of them is the theory of the firm. Uh, it's a theory of the firm that's uh, very different in many ways from that of Coase, which was based on transaction costs. The basic question in theory of the firm is uh, what activities go on within the firm and what activities go between the firms. The reason why this distinction is important is that within the firm, we don't typically use the price system. Most firms have, make very limited use of the price system. And those that do find it actually very problematic. Um, but between firms, we always use the price system. So the question is, why do we use, how, how, why is it that we organize from a societal point of view production where we have some parts where we don't use the prices at all and then other parts or hardly at all and other prices, places where we rely on, on prices? And what, the, what decides the boundary between those two? And the theory that we develop in our book is, the, is, is a knowledge-based theory. Knowledge moves more freely within firms than across firm boundaries. And one of the reasons why you don't want to set up a price system within the firm is that it would then create boundaries within the firm to the free flow of knowledge. Uh, so, in a way, there's a trade-off between learning and allocative efficiency, and the optimal boundary of the theory of the firm uh, balances these out. Uh, let me just talk about a few of the general lessons. A lot of these are examples of the second best ec economics. But whenever one talks about innovation and learning, one is in the world of second best economics. Um, and so, in a way, uh, the, the whole theory of innovation and the theory of creating learning society is, is involved in making these uh, uh, complicated trade-offs. The problem is that much of the standard theory, Washington consensus policies and development area, but similar policies in, in, in developed countries, are based on simplistic models. Um, which are consistent with simplistic ideologies. And these ideologies are used by special interests to advance particular policy uh, agenda. So if we talk, you know, if we think now about what is going on, there's a, there's a discussion on a trade agreement between uh, United States and Europe, a trade agreement between United States and Asia. And people, the discussion is, framed as if it's obvious that trade is a good thing, it will create jobs. And let me just say, most of that is nonsense. Uh, m if exports create jobs, imports destroy jobs. And balanced trade agreements are gonna have exports equal imports, or the change in exports equal the change in imports. You can't have trade imbalances going on forever. But if that's true, there's as much job destruction as job creation. And if the job, if comparative advantage is being exercised, in fact, you can show there'll be more job destruction than job creation. So all this stuff about job creation is, is basically nonsense. In any case, the issue today, when you talk about uh, uh, the trade agreements, tariffs have gotten very low. The only areas of where tariffs are not low are some very vested interests where they're not going to get very, any lower. So what are the trade discussions today about? They're about regulations and regulatory harmonization. But regulations are there for a reason. They're to protect consumers, they can protect workers, to protect the environment. Is the appropriate person, group, to be negotiating trade-offs between these protections to trade ministers? I, th I would argue no, because the, the corporate interest on both sides of the Atlantic can agree 
let's get rid of the regulations. That will increase our profits. But will that increase societal well-being? The reason the regulations, we may not have designed the regulations optimally, and if that's the case, we ought to be debating that. But the debate ought to be occurring in the parliaments, not in the trade ministers. Another example of this trade agreement uh, and the role of ideology, one of the provisions in the trade agreement that's now being discussed on both sides, both across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, are the provisions on investment. They sound like provisions that are supposed to give better property protections. But does one really believe that European property protections are worse than that in the United States? And if they are, should you increase them just for foreign firms? If there's something wrong with property protection, shouldn't they be for both foreign and domestic firms? And if there's a problem, who should be discussing it? Should it be the trade minister? Or should it be the parliament saying, what are the right property rights regime that we have? The answer is, this is not about property rights. It's about deregulation in the interest of the corporations over the interest of uh, the, the uh, uh, workers, the environment, uh, consumers. And that's related to, to the broader issue, growth, learning, innovation to what end. Much of the innovation in the banks in industrial countries has been directed toward saving labor. But in many developing countries, labor is in surplus, and unemployment is the problem. And that's actually a problem right now in both the United States and Europe. We have unemployment. Labor-saving innovations ex exacerbate this key problem. Uh, what we really need is, uh, what is really underpriced are natural resources and the environment. So we need to think about how do we create a learning society that's focused on directing, saving resources, and protecting uh, the environment. Well, let me... Uh, uh, forge ahead to, to uh, the final topic I'll have time to talk about here, which is Adam Smith, the Enlightenment and Business Responsibility. Uh, as many of you know, Adam Smith was a, played a key role in the Enlightenment. Uh, Edinburgh was one of the centers uh, of the Enlightenment. And uh, the Invisible Hand, as I began my talk, was one of the, uh, his important insights. But the invisible hand has often been misinterpreted by market fundamentalists in the Anglo-American tradition. Uh, the idea of the invisible hand was that by pursuing your self-interest, you would pursue the well-being of society. It's a wonderful idea, because what it says to every firm, be as greedy as you can, and don't feel bad about it, because by being greedy, you are serving the interests of society. It's an interesting idea, and, and, and any of you who uh, want to be greedy, this can give you a certain solace uh, as you go forward. But if you reflect a minute, how many uh, of you, uh, how many people believe that the greed of America's bankers served the well-being of society? either American society or global society. I don't think anybody really thinks that, except the bankers. So the question is, what was wrong with uh, this? Well, I've given you a, a whole set of arguments that, that uh, why the invisible hand often uh, uh, doesn't work, because it's, it's not there. And uh, uh, in a, in a broad sense, economic theory uh, has, has discredited uh, 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 these ideas. But interestingly, Adam Smith, when he talked about self-interest, had a broader concept than most of us today. He talked about enlightened self-interest. He, he, he had the idea that, that the, the, business, the, the, the individuals, the owners of the firms, were not thinking just narrowly in their self-interest, but trying to have a concept at the same time of the broader 
societal. So they, he didn't quite talk about it this way, but they had somehow were doing some job of internalizing the externalities that they imposed on others. They were trying to think about the social costs and benefits of their actions. In terms of broader economic uh, policy frameworks and the issue of corporate governance, uh, the Anna Smith view has led to people like Friedman arguing that firms should follow uh, a narrow view of maximizing shareholder value. And that's another area that I've written uh, with, with Sandy Grossman, and we've, we've shown that the view of shareholder value maximization being consistent with general societal welfare maximization is not in general true. That the only conditions in which shareholder value maximization is the appropriate objective of a firm from a societal point of view is when there are no market failures. So when you have perfect capital markets, perfect competition, no information asymmetries, all the list of conditions of where there are no market failures, then shareholder value maximization would be an appropriate objective. But in the absence of any of these others, one has to take a broader view of the objective of the firm, a, a view that's more consistent with what is sometimes called uh, the uh, stakeholder uh, view. So um, what that leads is to a general view that, that somehow uh, a very difficult task, but still one that's important, that one has to uh, 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 look beyond shareholder value maximization to a broader view of corporate responsibility of, of uh, the impact the actions it has, not only on the shareholders, but one's workers, the community, uh, and society more broadly. Well, the general principles of a learning society have broad implications uh, for the entire economic regime. And, and one of the points of our book is we go through how, how every, one, every part of our, of our economic regime can have an impact on uh, the uh, nature of the learning uh, that goes on in society. So the objective of this lecture is to provide a new lens through which one can examine uh, these and other policy choices facing uh, developed and developing countries in the coming years. Countries might like to pretend that they could avoid matters of industrial policy, following, for instance, the neoliberal doctrine that these are matters to be left to the market, but they can't. Uh, matters of education policy, the design of education systems, are social decisions which have to be addressed collectively. The choices uh, that we make in each of these areas will inevitably shape the economy, will shape the politics, and shape society, for better or for worse, for decades to come. Thank you. So I'm told we have time for some questions. Thank you, Professor Stiglitz. Uh, this is the first time I've uh, been enlightened on the <laughs> impact of economics and the combination of education within the, uh, how important education is within, for a country's economy. Now, you mentioned about uh, looking at metrics other than GDP for uh, societies and for development of economies. There is a country, small country in the world which is do already doing that. 
which uses the concept of gross, nat gross national happiness, as you may know. And they look at uh, things which are way beyond GDP. And education is, of course, one of the major components of uh, measuring the GNH. What I want to, uh, my question for you is, uh, what is it that the world, or what is it that uh, the economic from the, can learn from uh, the GNH concept? And is there something in that model that can be applied to the rest of the world? Well, uh, for those of you, you know, the, the, the country is Bhutan, and, and they, uh, they've actually been uh, pushing this idea now for more than 40 years, uh, GNH rather than GDP. It was, it was a great uh, 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 idea, and, and in a way, uh, uh, what we did on the International uh, Commission on the uh, Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress was to, in a way, elaborating on, on some of those ideas. Uh, the, maybe the best way, uh, Summer, try to say what are the big ways in which the, a broader measure differs from GDP? And there are, there are, there are, uh, are at least three or four things that I call attention to. Uh, the first is that, that um, uh, GDP doesn't have any sense of sustainability, environmental, social, or even economic sustainability. So if you looked at the US economy before 2008, a lot of people in Europe said, oh, look how well the US economy is performing. They didn't realize, because the GDP number didn't tell them this, that it was basically a mountain of debt, and it was a bubble and it wouldn't be sustained. And you can say more broadly, from a global perspective, the, the growth that we've had that's been based, uh, you know, depleting the, the, the uh, uh, th with the threat of global warming is environmentally not sustainable economic growth. There are countries whose growth has been based about depleting their natural resources. Again, not sustainable. So uh, there are a whole set of metrics that are called green GDP, which are complements or additions to that make corrections for environmental uh, degradation and resource depletion. So that's one example of, of uh, sustainability that you, you, you can't capture anything as complex as the whole economy or society in a single number. But what you can realize is that GDP doesn't tell you all the information you want, and you want to look at at some other variables, including particularly balance sheet variables. A second aspect of this is that um, GDP is an average. Say GDP per capita tells you the average production, GDP income uh, uh, per capita. But that average doesn't say whether all that income goes to one person or uh, whether it's equally divided. And GDP could be go per capita could be going up, and most citizens could be worse off. And this has actually been happening in the United States. This is not a, 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 a just a theoretical poss possibility. In the United States, GDP has gone up every year except 2009. GDP is much per capita is much higher than it was 25 years ago. But GDP per, but, but median income, the income of the person in the middle, today is lower than it was 25 years ago. So for the typical American family, there's been a quarter century of stagnation. You wouldn't get that if you listen to political people talking about how well our GDP is doing. Um, and there are many other aspects uh, of that. A third, uh, 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 important uh, uh, aspect is, is it doesn't capture many other aspects of what goes into well-being. Health, uh, individuals' capabilities, education. So there are a lot of things left out. And then there are a whole set of, of uh, problems that are uh, more technical but very important. How do you measure the government sector? How do you measure output in the service sector? So the bottom line out of all, or, you know, uh, just to mention a couple more, it doesn't measure insecurity. So, uh, which is an important part of individuals' well-being. So 
so-called reforms in the economy, which increase insecurity, might increase GDP. Typically, they don't. But even if they did, it doesn't mean that they are desirable, because the increase in insecurity may be far away any of the benefit in terms of the improvement in measured GDP. So that's why I think these are actually very important ideas, because they, 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 they would reframe a lot of the policy discussions. Uh, and uh, I, I think there's been a lot of policy discussions that have been misled by the, the single-minded focus on, on GDP. Uh, Professor, my name is Jerry. I'm from Taiwan, and I've been your reader for more than a decade. I actually brought the first book I read uh, in 2002. <laughs> and hopefully, I have time that you can give me an autograph. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I used to work in Silicon Valley, uh, uh, so uh, I'm now a venture capitalist in, in, in Paris. So obviously, I'm at the very extreme end of what we call uh, glorify innovation. <laughs> and there are many takeaways today. Uh, and one thing that fascinated me is what you mentioned when uh, for example, when you mentioned that when companies were destroyed, there were certain knowledge that were lost, and I presume that those were what we call the corporate knowledge or the institutional knowledge. Uh, I, on the other hand, has a, have a different view, and it's probably a, a very uh, a narrow view, and I'm hoping that you can enlighten me on that one. So in Silicon Valley, it's very common that people become entrepreneurs and companies fail. So every one out of 20 companies made it to the end, end zone or to the goal line. Another 15 probably went bankrupt. And what's precious about Silicon Valley for the past 30 or 40 years is that, yes, they were corporate knowledge, they were institutional knowledge, but uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, or, or if you work for startups, you also learn uh, very valuable uh, personal knowledge. And when the companies keep failing and you keep moving to the new company, that kind of knowledge was transferred across the firm and you created new ideas. And on the other hand, uh, what I'm seeing, because I'm from Taiwan, so I can't help but talk about the, the pride of Taiwan is that, a little bit like Japan, uh, the fact that many of the big corporates, they don't fail, that they, don't, they, they keep trapping the resources, whether through deregulation or through other kinds of like rent-seeking behavior, that actually trap also the human capital in the big corporates, and that actually inhibit the, uh, uh, what we call disruptive innovation. So on the other hand, we can, almost, uh, we can also argue that if you allow the companies to fail, and then there's actually more chance because you never know what the future will look like. And, and there's more chance for those personal knowledge to move across the border of the firms and to create something new. Thank okay. you. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Let me just say, Silicon Valley is an example, I think, of, of in a particular niche, in a particular area, of uh, relative success in creating a, a, a learning society. Uh, because actually uh, there is a strong interface. You know, why is Silicon Valley where it is? Because of Stanford University, basically, and, and lesser extent Berkeley, but, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, it's the connections between the universities and the, 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 the private sector that's been very fertile. In fact, th those of you who know, uh, the, the, the big companies uh, like Hewlett-Packard are actually located on Stanford campus. Uh, and, the, the, and so, you know, the, the, the distance is very small and the, 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 the structure of Silicon Valley created a, what's sometimes called a cluster that led to knowledge moving uh, freely. And you're right, there, there has to be a balance between total rigidity where you don't have enough uh, 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 mobility and the extreme on the other side. But to illustrate uh, the tensions, um, uh, Steve Jobs and Apple tried to create uh, an agreement among all the um, uh, major firms in the Silicon Valley not to hire uh, software engineers from each other. Uh, they didn't like the idea of knowledge spreading, but that wasn't the real objective. It was really a cartel, so that they, the owners of the firm, could get more of the ranks, and that the people who were actually producing the knowledge get lower wages. So 
That's the kind of thing which, when, when I talked before about impediments to learning, that in a way, they, were, they, you know, they, they preached all the time this innovative culture and people moving, but they actually made an agreement with each other to try to impede that learning, to impede that mobility. And finally, there was a suit, and, and it's just now being dismantled, this system. But it, it, it goes to the point that there are always these tensions between uh, uh, the forces that would try to restrict uh, the knowledge flow uh, and anti-competitive forces and those that would try to create a more innovative economy. Can I ask my question? Right, thank you. So I don't know how this works. But. Sir, thank you so much for being here. It's such a honor for us to uh, listen to you. So I come from a developing country, Tunisia. And when I try to Im implement your uh, recipe for success, basically education and industrial industri industrialization, I have two main problems. First, we have like a uh, very educated youth and very educated population. The problem is when I compare a degree uh, um, earned in Tunisia and a degree earned at HEC or at Columbia, I think the main difference is basically the access to a circle of alumni. So basically it's some kind of a cartel formation. People know people and they can get you the internships or they can get you a, a higher position in, um, in life. It's not really the knowledge that you acquire that is of a lower quality, but it's basically the uh, access to certain people. And the second problem for me is industrialization. So Tunisia tried import substitution industrialization in the 60s and it was a complete disaster because we were not competitive enough. And now when I, uh, um, and then they went into a uh, liberalization in Washington consensus. We had a lot of problems in wealth inequality, but at least uh, GDP was uh, growing at a, um, a, a higher pace. My, big, my biggest issue is, as a country in which you have like, um, a very educated population and you cannot compete with Germany in the uh, research and development side, you cannot be really uh, innovative because you don't have the capital to uh, innovate, and you cannot also compete with uh, Vietnam or China because their wages are much lower and they are much more competitive and their exchange rate is really, really low. What do you do? Do you, really, do you compete with Vietnam or uh, do you like, uh, put yourself in debt and try to compete with uh, Germany? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, those both good questions. Uh, let me say uh, this issue of um, uh, access that you talked about. This first issue is real. Is I think a really important one, and it emphasizes. You know, you, you, you talked about it between uh, 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 Tunisia and uh, the advanced countries, but within the advanced countries, it's also true that if you go to one of the elite schools, you're, you're connected, and if you don't go to one of the elite schools, you're not connected. And this relates, uh, I think, to a, a very big and very important issue that I've, I've written a lot about, which is equality and equality of opportunity. And that uh, we, we've created societies with less mobility, less equality of opportunity than we, than we, uh, than we realize. Uh, that in fact the the impediments are very serious. So, so give you one example that uh, that I think highlights how, how serious the problem is. That in the United States, uh, if you get admitted to a place like Columbia or Harvard, uh, we have uh, uh, free. Uh, we, we basically ask the uh, students how much they can afford, and uh, whatever the difference between the sticker price, 60,000, and what their parents can afford, we, pay, we, we make up for. So we have what's called needs blind emission. So that economics should not be impediment. But only eight to 9% of the students in the selective colleges are from the bottom 50%. So it's not the tuition is the impediment. It's, they haven't gotten the education at the elementary and secondary school to give them access. But then they don't have access to the, to the universities, and that denies them the access to 
a lot of the networks that you describe. So uh, I think this is one of the arguments why uh, it's, it's really very important uh, to try to create more, more uh, societies with more equal opportunity and more, more equality. Um, on the issue of import substitution, uh, it is true that import substitution has been a failure in many countries. But there's been almost no country that, that uh, developing countries that succeeded without an industrial policy of the kind I've described. So following this policy is not a guarantee for success, but not doing anything is almost a guarantee for failure. So uh, the, and, and, and the counter policies, if you look at what happened in Africa, for instance, sub-Saharan Africa, um, where the IMF went in with what I'll call structural adjustment, and they say you couldn't have any of these industrial policies. Today, uh, you know, 2014, 2013, the level of industrialization is lower than it was in 1980. They've de-industrialized, uh, and they have low wages. Uh, and the, the fact is that that they they. Uh, needed to have a proactive policy. Now, it is true that, that uh, the way they, these policies were managed in Asia were very were remarkably successful, but it wasn't one country that did it well. It was country after country. And most of these countries, when they did it, had very low levels of education. Korea, when it began, the average level of education was, was under five years. When Korea began this, it didn't have a well-functioning democracy. It didn't, you know, it, 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 it wasn't what you would call today a perfect political economy. Uh, but they developed certain rules of thumb that allowed them to manage this, these policies well. And I, the book, we describe some of the things that can be done. So in the case of Tunisia, the answer is, you don't have to compete in every industry with every country. All you need to do, the advantage of being a small country, uh, is that you, all you do, need to do is develop a comparative advantage in a relatively few industry, uh, products. I'm not talking about whole industries, but relatively few products. There are, uh, you know, one of the remarkable things about Tunisia is that it, it has succeeded in getting a high level of education. It has not succeeded in getting uh, uh, a, the industries that can use the high level of education. And you know we, we all know uh, it had a lot of political problems uh, uh, prior to 2011 and even since then. And the hope is that now the, 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 the political process will stabilize and the, the, the reservoir of high-skilled people will be one of the factors that will draw uh, firms to, Indonesia, to, 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 to Tunisia to produce. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that we've mentioned sustainability quite a number of times in our talks today. And we are, in fact, uh, students of the Masters of Sustainable Development at SSA. So uh, we often talk about how sustainability has impact over long term, and institutional investors look for uh, profits in the short to medium term, and which is why it is difficult to often convince them of arguments for sustainability. Uh, since they, it is perceived as something that benefits uh, corporates in medium to long term. Uh, I just want to ask you, what, what side of this debate personally would you say you would be on? And uh, I mean, what, kind of what kind of notion of sustainability is being uh, perceived right now? I mean, according to you, uh, what would you say is, uh, would be a good argument for convincing uh, the world, institutional investors, corporates, governments, uh, everyone to, to okay. sort of have this kind of uh, enlightenment happening with respect to sustainable development. Yeah, so, so I think there, there are two ideas here. One of them is uh, to change uh, the, the voting rights of corporations. 
uh, that right now uh, there the uh, uh, the corporation is run on the benefit with with a very short term focus, uh, but. Uh, there are uh, proposals, including by one of my colleagues at Columbia, Patrick Bolton, uh, to uh, basically have uh, voting rights in corporations that are commensurate with how long you've held the shares. So that basically those who have a long-term view are the ones who are running the firms. It is their votes. Who who determines? So so you move away from the the you 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 move away from the short term focus, which is dominate dominated corporate interests, particularly, I would say in the United States and the in the in the sort of Wall Street model of corporations. The second thing is there are some studies uh, which show that firms that have taken a more socially responsible view have actually done better. Now you might say, why is that? You know, so so example are are that, that there are some funds that have excluded industries that are bad industries that have excluded, for instance, uh, cigarettes. You know that, that have, have said we don't want to invest in products that kill people. Uh, so, and th these these funds have actually done better than funds that don't. And you might say, why is that? Because Normally, we say if you put restraints on who, what you purchase, it should lower performance. And the answer is in part that the firms that have been sensitive to these social issues are picking up broad, a, a, a sort of a, 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 they're picking up ahead of time social movements that are going to be legislated into law. So the, the funds that excluded cigarettes that did this 25 years ago, or 30 years ago, were picking up the fact that cigarettes were really a bad product and that society would eventually have to respond to the fact that they were a bad product by taxes, by restrictions, and that you don't want to be in a product that is eventually going to be um, uh, viewed as a taboo, as a, as a bad product. The same thing today about coal. If you ask me, uh, would I want to invest in coal? I'd say, you know, it depends. If I have a short-run horizon, that's one thing. But anybody with a long-term horizon would say, look at, especially a company that has a lot of dirty coal, and all coal is dirty, but some coal is dirtier than others, uh, that, it, it, that, 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 that eventually we will deal with the problem of climate change. Eventually we will be putting a carbon tax on, and these firms' value will go down. So by being sensitive to these concerns that have been articulated and expressed and for which there are good reasons, uh, companies that are thinking about this, you may get the timing off, but that's the, the problem of a short run investor. For the long term, you'll do better by uh, uh, being sensitive to these issues of sustainability than if you ignored it. So as the Dean of uh, Faculty at HEC, and uh, on behalf of my colleagues, but also on behalf of all our students, and more generally on behalf of the HEC community, um, it is my great privilege to actually award Professor Stiglitz with an honorary degree from HEC. Uh, but before I do that, or I'll take 30 seconds of your time, because Tomas informed us that Professor Stiglitz was left-leaning, and uh, so we will take advantage of this. Um, you may have read in the press in former years that Professor Stiglitz was an advisor to uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, so I would just like to inform 
Professor Stiglitz at Nicolas Sarkozy in France is not exactly <laughs> considered left-leaning, but may be seen from a US perspective, it's slightly different. But now, thanks to the new connections that he will be able to get with this honorary degree from HEC, he will be able to go visit another of our an alumni, uh, someone <laughs> whose alma mater is also HEC, and uh, hopefully he will uh, be able to provide him with very good advice on some of the issues that he uh, brought up with us today. Of course, I am talking of our current president, uh, François Hollande. And I think there is an article which dates back a long time. I must confess I did not read the article, but I did read the title, which I thought was extremely speaking and probably very useful for our current president. It is called A Note on Technical Choice under full employment, if you can do that, Francois Hollande will be forever grateful to you, <laughs> and in a socialist economy. I think we have all the ingredients that uh, are needed for this. So again, all jokes aside, I think we had a remarkably interesting and inspiring talk by uh, Professor Stiglitz. Um, I think he plays into some of the values that our dean tries to develop, um, foster at HEC, that it's not all about maximizing earnings, not all about making as much money as you possibly can. And I'm talking about the students. We made the mistake of becoming academics, so it's <laughs> too late for us. But I think, again, there is an interesting connection between our dean's values and the talk that uh, Professor Stiglitz gave us, so it is particularly both pleasant and a great honor for me to uh, award this uh, degree to Professor Stiglitz. And it comes with many little gadgets. One is the degree itself. <laughs> The second is a medal that commemorates the event. And the third <laughs> is unfortunately a little outdated because I believe it is a fountain pen. <laughs> but I'm hoping that Professor Stiglitz now writes his articles with a computer. But maybe if you ask for an autograph, this uh, uh, pen will come in handy. So thank, thank you, you very much thank you for you. coming to HTC. It was a pleasure. I would like to invite your wife also to join us on the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. I hope that there will not be any misinterpretation. The size of the different gifts <laughs> one for the woman and one for the man, but it's just to thank you very much, both of you, uh, for being here. Thank you very much. For, uh, thank you. Go. 